Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Atul Khosla, and welcome to the show. Welcome to this wonderful discussion. Uh, may I request other panelists to please join me? We have Professor Raman Ramanathan, Dr. Amrita Sadarangani, and Professor P.J. Narayan. May I please request them to join the webinar? Thank you. And once again, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Adal Khosla, and I'll be the moderator for the day today. The topic for discussion is going to be sustainability in the context of the new education policy and also opportunities for the state of Telangana. As we all understand, uh, the global educational, higher educational environment has dramatically changed. We are seeing some very, very big players emerging very, very strong. And they might even become stronger with the advent of online and COVID. The new education policy hopefully will put India into the world map of higher education. Hopefully, we'll have many, many more larger higher educational institutions. The big question that we have is, Who's going to fund this? How will this be funded? So I was doing some numbers over here. And as per my estimates, if we have to follow up and meet the 50% growth enrollment ratio that the government of India plans, we will need $1 trillion over the next 15 years. So what is going to be the funding plan for this $1 trillion? Is, this, is there going to be a government-private partnership that we saw a lot in the United States after the World War? or it's going to be more government funded as we saw in India in the past. I think some of these questions we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, like I said, government public funding. We'll speak about competitive grants. Can private universities pitch into those? Can they partner with global players like the University of Edinburgh? And finally, how can they tap into endowments? So that's really going to be the discussion for the day today. I'm going to start with uh, uh, asking each of the panelists to speak about four to five minutes on the views. We will please stick to four to five minutes. Would love some recommendations. What can Telangana do very specifically uh, to build great universities of the world? Before I actually get into this, I'd like to lay a little bit of context. When we look at funding and look at size of institutions, let's look at a top 20 global university like UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. The total funding of UPenn, yearly funding, is something in the region of $20 billion. That's the annual funding of UPenn. And I'm sure University of Edinburgh might have very similar funding numbers. And IIT, a big IIT like IIT Bombay typically, will have funding of around uh, 1,500 to 2,000 crores. That's fundamentally different in terms of size and scale. So do we believe Indian institutions can compete with this very, very large global players? Will innovation play a role over here, or we'll have to ramp up our overall numbers in terms of sustainability and financials? I think that's going to be the topic today. So I'm going to request Professor PJ Narayanan to start, and we'll then go to Amrita, and then I'll give my views. Over to you, Professor Narayanan. Good morning. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, thanks uh, for the organizers to invite me and give me the opportunity. Uh, I am the director of uh, IIIT, the International Institute of Information Technology at Hyderabad. Our own institute started in 1998 uh, in today's, which is a young institute by global institutional standards, but the Indian pantheon of institutions, we are definitely the middle age institutions, at least in the engineering and uh, that areas. So uh, this is a very important question in the light of NEP or before that also, the idea of sustainability of institution. So let me tell you a little bit about our own institution that is also located in Telangana. In Telangana, started has has two glorious examples of uh, institutions which are uh, which are uh, self-sufficient or, or hopefully sustainable. Not only 20 years old now. One is our own uh, IIIT Hyderabad, which started in 1998 as an institution that focuses on broad IT areas, but a very research-oriented institution, not just provide graduates or, or, or teaching program. Then we have our neighbor, uh, the ISB, Indian School of Business, which is focused very narrowly on the you know broad MBA and or that space of uh, topics. Uh, and both have done very well in the last uh, 20 years that they existed. ISB started in 2001, started classes. We started in 1998. 
both uh, received a generous uh, land support and a few things from the state government in fact uh, isb was you know there's a big competition between multiple states to to house uh, isb but uh, none of these institutions has received any even a single rupee from the any governmental sources for its routine uh, uh, operations of salaries or bills and so on we raise every one every rupee ourselves uh, i can tell more about our, my own institution and uh, we get money for the tuition fees of course uh, about more than half our uh, revenues today but we also get money from um, uh, for the research is supported through various research grants and uh, in the last couple of years the research grants have been split almost evenly 50 50 between governmental sources and uh, corporate sources in the early years of course governmental sources uh, dominated because we needed to establish our uh, credentials and and their track record before the, the the private sector would come and start funding research and we also have a, a fundraising effort started we being a young institution we can't have we don't have alumni who can endow big time but we have started very small uh, in within 5 years of the first grad first batch graduating they have been supporting in uh, scholarships for needy students within the institution for since for the last 15 years or so and uh, we are expanding that on uh, other uh, as aspects especially infrastructural aspect so you look at institution like ours which is uh, thankfully focused on a very niche and area that is kind of current today that is it broad it areas so uh, like i said more than 50% of our revenues come from uh, from tuition fee which is possible to do because we have you know as an institution we are told we have the highest uh, Uh, average salary of for the outgoing bachelor's graduate of any institution in india i mean we don't believe in this kind of numbers so much others tell us this you know in an it field and being a top institution that's not surprising uh, at the same time the the money required to fund infrastructure you know if you are a good institution you want to grow and you want to expand society expects you to do that money to to fund the buildings and hostels and other uh, classrooms these are these are this take as much money by our calculation the running expenses will cost almost equal to the the capital expenses for expansion per you know if you if you annualize it per per student basis and we cannot increase tuition to that level then we'll become some other kind of institution so uh, this is a challenge we we are doing quite well and similar is the story with isb and 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 sure so this going forward uh the nep also talks about multidisciplinarity so both isb and triple it are examples of being in the right discipline in this times where you cannot you can actually get uh, attention of uh, prospective students and funding agencies and be able to you know we are able to do well financially because of that i, I cannot imagine starting programs even in regular sciences not to talk about social sciences and the broad areas of uh, that that any university should focus on and uh, because the 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 tuition fee that you can charge in those areas it will be uh, not be the same as what we can do in uh, comfortably in these areas so sustainability is about that but it's also about sustainability of the model how can institutions whether it is large universities or small institutions relatively small institutions like triple it hyderabad how can institutions also sustain the model you know a good institution dynamic institution should be able to start new program but it should be able to also close old program which are not uh, somehow working out as well as you know if they should so uh, the, the the institutional model a good thing about nep is that it it at least talks about institutions being completely uh, autonomous in the sense the boards or board of governors which exists in all institution whether it is the state universities the central universities or the iits but uh, do they have the full power to appoint themselves appoint the director etc today that is not the case uh, institution like ours or isb do have that uh, because we are not taking you know regular money from the government our uh, board of governors or equivalent are, are are empowered to to do those decision but transferring that to every institution is envisaged in nep i hope that really happens then the institution will have the ability to chart their own course so uh, sustainability in 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 financial sense as well as in the models programs etc are very important for any institution to grow scale is is you know 
with scale that is increasing the number of students is a way to to sustainability but that has its own problems uh, in terms of infrastructure requirement in terms of uh, the the problems that can come the example is of course we have university of pennsylvania you mentioned there is edinburgh university or all the big universities there are also caltech which is uh, 2200 students today they are 100 years old they are ranked among the top institutions in the world and consistently they are 2200 students and 500 or 600 faculty members a very 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 healthy ratio of faculty to student etc so they got set up in a different time and geography how can we replicate any of those ideas in india that's a challenge but new ideas are required to to do that and, and i'm hopeful there will be more institution that will do the same uh, that's where i'll stop right now uh, thank you uh, i think great insights uh, professor narayanan it reminds me around uh, 15 to 18 years back when i used to be at mckinsey and company and i was actively involved with the setting up the indian school of business uh, how dynamic at that point of time the state of andhra pradesh was bidding for the indian school of business and making sure that the institution is set up in hyderabad so congratulations for that uh, one recommendation for the uh, state of telangana uh, state of telangana has done very well in getting these two institution they should think uh, they should support more institutions you know the support is see institutions can get far by giving by getting support that is foundational you know that is uh, infrastructure or something very foundational paying bills every day bills is not a very good way of uh, supporting institution because that that money gets spent very quickly so uh, telangana has been doing well in uh, you know they have, after telangana is formed they have been equally if not more progressive about uh, supporting institution like uh, ours and isb and they should continue that that the, the private uh, university act of telangana is now uh, operational there are few institutions have started a few universities have started they should uh, provide similar support that we and uh, isb got many years ago to these other institutions that are coming up thank you i think that's great input uh, we have uh, mr ramanan ramanathan with us could you please switch on your camera sir lovely so yeah. uh, mr ramanathan is the mission director of the atal incubation mission uh, innovation mission we all know what a wonderful role you're playing the topic is right up your sleeve sir uh, indian institutions need innovation indian in innovation indian universities will have to uh, bring in innovation create more startups hopefully you know we spoke, speak about the stanford model bring in more uh money through sustainability through new startups etc so you've been playing a great role in this one uh, as far as the atal incubation mission is concerned uh, mr manathan would love to hear your views uh, how does your mission interact and align with the new education policy a uh, very specific recommendation that you might have for the state of telangana yeah uh, thank you atul and uh, good morning to everybody who has logged on to this call i hope all of you are safe and healthy in these very difficult covid-19 circumstances and you are practicing the safeguards that are advocated by your health authorities or government institutions <coughs> or whichever institution you are part of um first of all i would i need uh, to share that the new education policy is um, very well aligned with uh, the atal innovation mission initiatives uh, that were launched about 3 and a half years ago Uh, as most of you are aware the atal innovation mission was launched uh, by the honorable prime minister under the auspices of the niti aayog which is a national institution for transforming india and the purpose was this was a transformational initiative uh, conceived as a transformational initiative and also conceived as a very holistic initiative uh, how do you create a culture of innovation um, in the country uh, and how do you create a problem solving innovative mindset which is the precursor for entrepreneurship and which is a precursor for innovation if you don't create that culture of innovation and you do not give opportunities and uh, tools and empowerment uh, to be able to create the culture of innovation uh, you can dream of creating a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, innovators but that will not happen the second is how do you create the ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship that is going to enable these young innovative minds bright innovative minds who have been exposed to this culture to be able to express themselves through their innovation through their entrepreneurship through their startup initiatives and so on and of course uh, the um, honorable prime minister in his very eloquent address of atmanirbhar bharat uh, identified the five pillars 
uh, of Atmanirbhar Bharat that is important to be focused on. And in all of these pillars, unless you have innovation, entrepreneurship ingrained and integrated into every one of the activities related to these pillars, uh, you're not going to make much headway. So take, for example, the first pillar, the pillar of demographic dividend that you talked about. Uh, how do we ensure that a country which is having 1.3 billion people, uh, 1.4 million schools, uh, 10,500 engineering and related institutions, 39,000 colleges, and more than 150 million young students entering into the workplace. How do you empower them and inculcate in them a culture of innovation and problem solving so that they become not just rote learners at the school level or the university level, uh, trying to just move from one uh, level to another uh, by getting marks in an exam, but how do you actually convert this entire educational system into a problem solving, innovative mindset based education system? where people learn how to solve problems, leveraging technologies that are emerging out in the marketplace and which is going to constantly change. It's going to uh, be enhanced. It is exponentially changing. So how do you create this culture of innovation that is continuously able to absorb new technologies, new ways of solving problems, and then use that to create a nation of job creators? We want not just a nation of job seekers. We have proved ourselves in that. It has served us very well so far. Uh, we are a $190 billion industry with all the schools and universities uh, and the emphasis on education uh, for engineering and so on. Uh, but we have primarily been a nation which is servicing the needs of the world as well as some of the needs of India uh, through job seeking. How do we now transform uh, the entire mindset and enable a nation of job creators and a nation of innovators, a nation of startups? And I think... Um, uh, a lot has been happening in the startup world, as all of you are aware. Uh, we have now more than 50,000 startups in our country. Uh, we have more than 34 unicorns. Uh, in fact, the latest study showed uh, from the GII index that more than 60 Indians are responsible for unicorns across the world, uh, out of which uh, 30 to 34 are based in India and the other are based outside. So that's a remarkably large number of Indian innovators making their stamp for the rest of the world. It just shows that we have never lacked for great innovators, great thinkers, great scientists, great engineers and doctors uh, or philosophers or artists. But what it has shown is that when they get chance to get exposed to an ecosystem of innovation, uh, they are able to realize their full potential. So you have a Satya Nadella heading Microsoft, a Sundar Pichai heading Google, uh, uh, Shantanu Narayan heading Adobe, you have a number of our Indian professors leading in uh, world-class universities, uh, that are leading doctors. All of them, when they get a chance to get exposed to that level of uh, innovation uh, and entrepreneurship ecosystem, they blossom and they are able to contribute tremendously to the economy. So how do we ensure that we in India are able to create that? And that is why the Atal Innovation Mission has focused on, at a school level, creating thousands of tinkering labs, which will create this culture of innovation. In a manner of speaking, the Atal Tinkering Labs have been a forerunner for the new education policy in terms of exposing young children uh, who have the appetite, who have the desire, uh, who have an innate innovative talent to get exposed to the latest of technologies like 3D printers, robotics, IoT, miniaturized electronics, and augmented virtual reality through do-it-yourself kits. But more importantly, what it has exposed, and I would say these are technology platforms which are going to change. Every year, you're going to have something new coming up. You now have artificial intelligence do-it-yourself kits. You're going to have blockchain do-it-yourself kits. And you're going to have many other do-it-yourself kits emerging out. Just yesterday, uh, I was talking with the director of Lego, uh, who have introduced Mindstorm, a wonderful kit for young children to be able to innovate in, in um, robotics. And that is between grade 6 to grade 12. But the more important thing is that what the Atal Tinkering Labs have been able to do and what universities have to do and what our higher educational institutions have to do in much greater measure is introduce everybody to the art of problem solving, problem identification, design thinking, critical thinking, and acquire all skills which are required, which is why the emphasis on vocational skills, the emphasis on uh, knowledge and academic courses and research is as important as the, as the focus on innovation. And so at the school level today, we have more than 5,000 tinkering labs uh, with more than two and a half million students exposed to all these technologies. And it's marvelous 
to see how these young students at grade 6 to grade 12 are innovating creating robotic based waste management systems iot solar panel based irrigation management systems healthcare surveillance systems i mean for covid 19 we have had a number of young students create solutions which are contactless doorbells and so on and so forth uh, i mean you have to see what is happening in that community to be able to believe it and telangana has been a leader in terms of the number of schools who have been uh, having atal tinkering labs i think they have more than 400 to 450 atal tinkering labs and this government i have to compliment the government for taking a very uh, uh, integral role in you know on a voluntary basis um, there are the, the telangana uh, educational councils uh, they have created a network of mentors beyond the mentors of change that we have created across the country to be able to support all these tinkering labs now if you go to the next level of education which is the higher universities and so on we need to create world class incubators of course all our startups uh, we have a startup nation but uh, so far um, more than uh, it's not been found it has been found through uh, data that is uh, that is quite evident that without an incubator or without the support that an incubator allows in eliminating or overcoming the various valleys of death as they call in a uh, startup life cycle most of the startups a great idea doesn't germinate into a great product it doesn't germinate into a great company and it doesn't become a great a multinational company that is what we have to facilitate and that is why we are setting up incubators across the country in universities and in institutions which will be able to foster uh, 25 to 30 startups every 2 years by giving a grant of 10 crores to every university which is applying and successfully applies and merits a atal incubator today we have in our country not just from atal innovation mission initiatives but other initiatives also close to about 400 to 500 incubators in our country and that's very good from my point of view any world class university should have a world class incubator in order to enable the young talented students from that university have an opportunity to create a startup to create an entrepreneurial initiative to be able to become a potential job creator you don't give that opportunity then the rest of the stuff is the university is just going to get a placement officer every university today has a chief placement officer and their only job is how you can place the students for a job how about having every university have a research and innovation development officer and ensure that all the organizations with whom they are contact with get an exposure to the innovative capability of the university get an exposure to the research capability of the university and becomes an integral part of selecting innovation projects and innovation products rather than just selecting people that is the transition that we have to do as a nation uh, to be able to come up to the stanford level and so on you look at the mit and you look at the harvards and you look at the stanfords and so on and then you find that there is a whole lot of student population who gets enabled enthused and energized to be able to address Uh, startup opportunities which are out there and the research which is done in the universities moves into an applied research form some of them and then they move on into innovation and that is what the atal innovation mission is trying to do through the atal incubator scheme today we have more than 70 incubators across the country more than 1500 startups have got uh, originated from here over the last two and a half years and that's an amazing number just to see the number of startups coming out and out of that what has been most heartening from my perspective is that there are 500 women led startups from these 1500 startups now that's close to about 30% or 33% of the of the startup we wanted to become 50% so that this gender equality uh, the gender diversity and the benefits of gender diversity in entrepreneurship and innovation has a tremendous impact in fact i want to share with you that in the atal tinkering lab we run what is known as a tinkering marathon every year where students are given challenges and they identify problems within that particular sector and they create an innovation a prototype of an innovation that is finally selected uh, for recognition in the last year more than 50000 students participated in that more than 8000 prototype of innovations got created and in the top 200 45% of the winners were girl students now that is showing that girl in fact what why this number is very important is we still don't have 50% enrollment of girls in schools so which means our enrollment of girls in schools is still below the 40% mark or 30% mark in many schools but when we have 45% of the winners it shows the tremendous capacity 
of the girl student to be able to leverage their innovative skills and and demonstrate their innovative capability and entrepreneurial capability out there and this is something that we need to enable the th third initiative that we have is community innovation centers and again in community innovation centers we get the universities to be able to contribute to that now all of this is perfectly aligned with the new education policy the new education policy as the honorable prime minister said it focuses on five pillars one is the pillar of access how are you going to enable all the students from all the communities have access to world class educational facilities second is it addresses the problem of equality equality of you know gender equality of uh, whether uh, irrespective of the economic base uh, that you have uh, how do you bring that equity uh, to uh, to bear uh, in every aspect of education so that our children uh, get educated and become innovative and become not only great in their jobs which they are seeking but also become great job creators the third is the quality of the institution the pillar of quality how do you bring standardization and therefore the hci which has been formed is the umbrella organization under which you are able to standardize on the educational uh, requirements the processes the methodologies the, the infrastructure and so on and so forth which is so very crucial if you want to have a quality education system the fourth is the affordability aspect how do we ensure that education becomes affordable across the country we are 715 districts out of which 115 are aspirational districts and these aspirational districts are at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of access to good healthcare education etc etc and so on so that affordability has to be addressed not only by from an economic point of view or a facilitation point of view but also leveraging digital technology which can play a very great role in reducing the cost and enabling you with this access and finally it also focuses on the pillar of accountability how do we ensure that uh, we you know our educational systems are accountable in terms of creating world class uh, students and innovators across the country so for that you have to have facilities like incubation uh, you have to have great mentoring capability you have to have wonderful relationship with the private sector and all the other stakeholders and that has to be we need to have great alumni networks for example one one thing which is missing in indian universities is the focus on alumni uh, students go out and become very good they go abroad but they don't have a means of connecting back and giving back to the society from which they came from to the community of school on colleges where they graduated from and we need to enable all of that because the more you have the stakeholders the more you are going to be able to enable all of this and finally i i do think you know if you look at the global innovation index where we when we left from uh, 81 rank 81 in 2015 to rank 48 right now a close analysis of all the gii parameters shows a few things which are pretty surprising uh, but then you when you look upon it it is not so surprising also uh, we have scored very highly in creative outputs and knowledge outputs that is the amount of investment that we do in research and innovation as compared to the outcomes of research and innovation are disproportional and disproportional in the right area i mean we create more outputs than the inputs that we give now that is the the good news the bad news is we are not doing enough of it so we are only spending 0.78% of our gdp on r&d whereas we should be going aspiring to 2% or up to 3% now this many people will say how does the government play a role in all of this but i think the private sector has to play a much bigger role in in the enablement of research and development in our country in any advanced economy that you see 70% of the r&d comes from the private sector uh, you look at programs like yozma in israel you look in uh, korea the brain korea and so on and so forth you look at the metal stand in germany you look at uh, a front of a uh, set of institutions which uh, um, are are enabling private sector to contribute to applied research and development everywhere private sector plays a very big role how do we incentivize and attract the private sector to play a much bigger role in our universities to spawn world class research in areas where we still are having a level playing field artificial intelligence nano computing cognitive computing biotech uh, all of these are absolutely nascent fields where india has a chance to leapfrog into the future 
as much as any other country has. So how do we now get the private sector excited and get them to participate in this revolution that is happening? That is important. And I also want to compliment Telangana government. I think they've been doing a brilliant job with uh, the universities, the focus on uh, not only IT education, but also on the arts and the sciences and the commerce institutions, uh, business management. Uh, you need to have a holistic approach. It is not just engineering which is going to take us to the future. It is a combination of blended arts and science and technology that's going to enable uh, to see the new India of our dreams. With that, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share a few words and a few thoughts on this occasion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramanan. You know, I always believe that institutions of higher learning become so critical as far as the uh, broader community development is concerned. Let's go back and look at the Silicon Valley. My belief is Silicon Valley exists because of Stanford and UC Berkeley. And there's so many more examples. You've got the uh, the telecom corridor in, uh, in Boston because of Harvard and MIT. You've got the manufacturing corridor out there in uh, Shanghai because of Tsinghua University. So institutions of higher learning will play a great role. And it's so heartening to know that with initiatives like yours, there'll be many, many more such innovation coming into India. Uh, I'm gonna make a very strong statement over here and please don't mind me, uh, but I went to IIT Kanpur and when I look at Kanpur as a city and look at the contribution of IIT Kanpur to the city of Kanpur, I feel very ashamed. I feel ashamed because while IIT Kanpur was progressing, the city of Kanpur went into the dogs. And uh, that's really the story of Indian higher institutions. Hopefully with efforts like yours and efforts of our dear prime minister, uh, these things will be reversed and we will soon maintain the type of glory that we always wanted to. Uh, I've now got with me uh, uh, Ms. Amrita, who's from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, one of your board members is a very dear friend, uh, Ms. Amrita Fraser. And I was actually with her uh, six months back before COVID hit us. And uh, there's a typical tussle between Oxbridge and University of Edinburgh, like it typically is between the IITs and the non-IITs in India. Uh, and clearly the whole issue of sustainability and funding would always come up where the primary funding from the government always going to the, you know, the Oxbridge, which is Cambridge and Oxford always sort of uh, getting most of it. So I would love to hear your thoughts about, you know, what's really happening in the UK system. They're also looking at, you know, bringing in more private funding, uh, sustainability models are being challenged and how can India learn from uh, the UK model, Amrita? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khosla, and thank you to uh, Fiki and others who've organized this for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm the Regional Director of South Asia for the University of Edinburgh and I've been based in Mumbai with the university since 2010. So a few words about the university and then, you know, what we're doing in India and how it all ties together with, with the questions being talked about here. So the University of Edinburgh was uh, established 437 years ago. Um, it has today 45,000 students, about 40% of which are international. Uh, one of the most interesting statistics I think to share is that we have four and a half thousand academics, but about 6,000 professional services staff amongst uh, which I count myself as one. And that is one of the key differences that we see between Indian and, and global universities. Um, we are uh, a top 20 uh, global institution. We've been ranked 2020 uh, 20 by QS World 2020 rankings this year. And um, I think what the way we see ourselves as an institution, we are very much about one knowledge. Uh, we are create, uh, curators and creators of knowledge. Uh, we are about skilling people uh, and, and supplying that that you know, pool, those pool of people to, to the public sector, to industry. We are very much about social mobility. We are about providing opportunities for people, for first, uh, first generation learners to, to grow and develop and to impact their families. And this very much centered around the UK as a civic university, but also uh, globally. We are about economic growth. Um, so we are about job creation. Uh, we have an arm called Edinburgh Innovations, which helps uh, you know, commercialize uh, in every way, uh, spin-ups, uh, spin-outs, startups, um, consultancy, uh, contracting, etc. Since 1967, when Edinburgh Innovation was established, we have spun out, we've launched more than 500 companies. 
since 2010, these companies have had an 85% survival rate. That's just, but we have a very high survival rate, I think, all through the life of this. Um, so Edinburgh is, is, of course, very well known because, you know, Scotland and Tartan and the history, and we like being known for all those things, but we're also, you know, known for some of these more uh, sort of innovative um, industry-led um, sort of statistics. Um, and last uh, sort of thing for us is uh, civic leadership. Uh, we see ourselves very much as a university that's embedded into the city. We have a civic responsibility to the city and we engage with it at all levels, whether it's the person walking on the street, looking at our buildings, wanting to come in and engage, wanting to know what we're doing, um, and also providing um, you know, an, a very open conversation and communication, whether it's a you know, vibrant form of um, lectures or events. We invite people in, we give people a voice. Um, for myself, as an employee of the university, but based overseas, I can walk into the university, ask anyone a question, and I will be given an answer. Similarly, at the Scottish Parliament. Um, so that's, you know, uh, who we are as an institution. Uh, why are we here? Uh, why are we here in India and uh, also have presences across uh, seven other regions across the world? For us, diversity, uh, inclusion, um, and innovation in our global engagement is very, very important. Edinburgh has always been a global university uh, since its inception. We've had one of the first Indian and Chinese students to, to study abroad. Um, but And we've respected that. We had the first Indian Student Association to be established in the UK. Um, and today, that engagement uh, is not about, you know, simply recruiting large numbers of Indian students. We have a very, uh, an excellent student population on our campus, but it's not just about that. We have a huge portfolio of research partnerships in India. We have a very interesting uh, history of student mobility uh, across India, faculty engagement across India between our faculty and the university. So just some statistics, we have had a uh, joint publication of about 185 papers with an incredibly high impact factor only in the last three years with India, with 106 institutions. The joint funding coming out of UK-India research just with Edinburgh, only to Edinburgh is over 30 million pounds in the last three years only. So, um, you know, and, and again, this is not just about money. This is about the deep relationships we are building, and this is about impact. So most of our work in India is about addressing the global challenges, you know, SDGs, and, you know, we learn as much from our Indian partners as we do, um, as we feel that we contribute to them. Um, what does sustainability to us mean in terms of financial sustainability at these times? I think... Um, for all of us as educational institutions, it's very important not to be complacent. Uh, yes, we are structured and um, you know quite differently from Indian institutions. We are a government institution. We are not you know a private institution like some of the top American institutions we've been talking about. But over the years, we have reduced our reliance on government support, and we have yes, we have endowments. Um, we have um, a very strong industry engagement. We also engage very much with, you know, trusts, uh, philanthropists, etc. So we have, uh, and I think our industry engagement is very interesting. Uh, other than, you know, the spin-out startups, entrepreneurship that we promote, for example, uh, we have partnered with Legal and General, a big uh, UK-based firm, uh, with uh, on a 20 million pound piece of research, very relevant to today's situation of, you know, uh, in terms of supporting aging health, lifestyle, uh, and all of that. So it's about partnering with organizations that share the same values, that share the same you know, goals, but not really trying to put it in a box. This is not a very typical uh, university uh, company engagement. Um, and another interesting form of engagement is um, we have uh, a lot of innovation hubs across the university focused on some of the expertise areas. So for example, we're one of the oldest institutions to teach artificial intelligence. It's now called the School of Informatics. It started off being the School of Artificial Intelligence in the 1960s. And that institution is doing research from everything, from how you control uh, crowds and, and population when the, the population of the city of Edinburgh, which is tiny, uh, of just about 600,000 people to 2 million when during the, the Edinburgh festivals in August in normal times, pre-pandemic times. And how does the city manage that? Uh, to, uh, to to working on, you know, the robot um, uh, with NASA, uh, Valkyrie, you know, preparing for the mission to Mars, etc. So, 
So it's about um, sort of innovation and engagement. It's about not putting ourselves in boxes. It's about agility. Um, so yes, uh, we are lucky that our you know international student uh, and UK student and European student populations are not hugely affected this year. We're blessed with that. But we are certainly challenged with the income that one usually would see from conferences, events, accommodation. And that's not going to return uh, you know, anytime soon. So I know that we have very strong systems of governance, um, oversight. Um, there's lots of discussions, not talking about what's happening today and how we address this, but it's about you know, future proofing and understanding that this is, um, you know, this is how things are and this is you know, how we need to uh, be. So um, I hope that, uh, and also, yeah, uh, thank you very much to Telangana. We uh, have been very interested in engaging uh, more deeply with the, with the, with the state. Uh, we're very interested, uh, Mr. Ramanathan, with all that you've said about, um, you know, the, the ambition to engage with uh, in, in these sort of new innovation models. And I think we can offer models um, and we'd love to develop new ones in partnership with India. So I hope that helps and uh, look forward to a little more discussion on this. That's so wonderful, uh, Amrita. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a blunt question over here. Uh, the new education policy looks at uh, foreign institutions establishing campuses in India. Are you guys looking at that? Will Telangana be a choice for you? So the University of Edinburgh is very interested in engaging in India, and we have been in, in very interesting ways. One of our models of engagement will not include taking an Edinburgh University and setting up an Edinburgh University anywhere else in the world. Uh, but we are, you know, very open to partnership, and, our part and those kind of partnerships need not be with another university. So we are, um, for example, we have in China a couple of uh, engagements where we are partnered with the university to, to develop a new program that's discreet for that, uh, you know, whatever requirement and the context. Uh, but in India, we are actually hoping to engage directly with the government and with other players in higher education. We very much like to talk to industry. From, from myself, you know, the, ideally the partnership would be industry. Uh, government and I think state governments are very powerful and have a great opportunity here to to you know uh, address these uh, challenges uh, to come together to create a new model. So does an Edinburgh University want to you know talk about getting land and putting up a building? No, uh, but do we want to engage in creating something that's hugely sustainable, that's exciting both for us and the partners in India? You know whether it's about uh, curriculum, new models of teaching, um, you know. Uh, working to create new models of innovation with industry, yes, we're very open to that. I'd like to uh, just add here, uh, Atulji and... Uh, Please go Amaraji. ahead. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, we have been building a number of relationships with universities uh, in different parts of the world uh, from two or three perspectives. One is, how do you simulate innovation exchange between universities in India and universities here? Uh, we have now a very thriving and a vibrant uh, incubation ecosystem in many universities. So it is of great advantage to be able to bring together, uh, you know, universities like the University of Edinburgh uh, and have uh, tie-ups on innovation exchange, startup exchanges from these universities or incubation exchanges uh, between these universities uh, and, and uh, partners here. Uh, we have set up, for example, uh, with Nanyang University, the Niti Aayog has enabled a relationship with them in specific areas like artificial intelligence and so on. So there may be areas that uh, universities across the world, like the University of Edinburgh may be uh, wanting to focus on. And so we'll be able to find and help in building such partnerships. The second is, uh, there is also, uh, you know, a tremendous merit in being able to launch uh, hackathons and challenges, uh, which are common to both the countries um, and combining maybe the skill and the scale uh, that is uh, available in Edinburgh and the scale that is offered in India uh, to be able to implement and pilot some of these solutions that em emerge out of these challenges. So that's again an area that um, uh, quite a few universities from different parts of the world are are working with Atal Innovation Mission and, uh, we, and not only with us but with DST and so on and so forth. So we'll be more than happy to facilitate from the government side and from Niti Aayog side any initiatives on that. Thank you very much. We are we can more Go ahead, Amrita. Go ahead. 
Yes, no, thank you very much. We are more than open. We've been following your development. We've had some interesting conversations at the uh, DPIO level uh, around our expertise in artificial intelligence uh, as related to robotics and manufacturing, but you know, also on data science related to health. Uh, right. So one of the things that I wanted to briefly mention is that um, the UK, Scottish and EU governments have jointly awarded um, uh, very significant funding to the University of Edinburgh. 60 or 70 percent of this funding goes to the University of Edinburgh to help create Edinburgh and the southeast of Scotland as the data capital of Europe. And what that means is just making the entire population data literate, whether it's from you know toddlers up to, to sort of continuing education, and uh, you know how do we create this sustained program of, of sort of engagement around that in the community. I mean, we've seen you know institutions like the Triple IT, Triple IT Hyderabad. I, so I haven't engaged with you directly, but you know, with your predecessor, I've had some excellent discussions. These are you know institutions I think ready to us. You already, as you said, you're doing very well. You're internationally, globally respected and recognized. Um, can we take this you know further? Uh, sure. Can we take it to another dimension? Sure. I'm so glad that matchmaking is already happening on this forum. So uh, thank you for bringing it up, uh, Ramana. Uh, I'd like to also mention over here that uh, uh, when we think about innovation, it's so much about the culture that you bring in into a higher educational institution. Uh, at Shulani, which I founded in Himachal Pradesh, uh, we've always believed that research and innovation should be in the heart of an institution. So as we speak, we are one of India's leading uh, patent filers, all done by students. Our uh, research impact is amongst the highest in the country, top three in the country, actually. And uh, we all get it funded through different competitive grants. So I think if there are other institutions which are private in nature, which are listening to us, I would like to say that many times we try to become ostriches and keep on complaining uh, against the government. There's enough funding which is available. I think the desire is important and the culture of innovation uh, you need to bring it into the institution and then you've got great partners like University of Edinburgh also ready to partner uh, if you've got the right culture out there. Uh, uh, because the topic is going to be uh, the government of Telangana and uh, we want to give some recommendations to them. We'll go, uh, I, Raina, I'm coming to you only, absolutely I'm coming to you. So yeah. why don't we give yeah. your thoughts and also at least three recommendations for the uh, government of Telangana. To me, from your end, yes, sir. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, be, you know, to continue the both both what uh, Amrita and uh, Ramanan uh, mentioned. You know, to, uh, it's very important to have uh, innovation and startup culture is very, you know, in, in, in part of the universities. And uh, IIIT Hyderabad, we started our incubator in uh, in uh, nine, 2008, and we completed 10 years, and we had. We were told in about five years time from then we were told we are among the largest academic incubators in the country. We didn't know that. Somebody else told us looking at our statistics. And then, uh, you know, the Telangana government invested very heavily into this whole thing. They set up T-Hub and I can proudly say T-Hub was is definitely located in our, ca our campus, but it grew out of the experience of our own incubator. It was the, the, one of the very first meetings we had with the IT minister, uh, you know, we said our incubator is doing well and we are running out of space. He said that's a happy problem to have and that's a problem we would like to fix. And then, uh, you know, that was the 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 the, the root of this whole T hub and the entire environment that uh, Telangana is trying very hard to create. And one recommendation I would have to Telangana government is, you know, they are doing it already. They are taking it not just to you know, a few elite institutions in Hyderabad or around but also to the, the tier two tier three cities uh, towns in the country in the in the state and to other institutions they have had us they have started a process of establishing this innovation or startup or incubators in every university and i think it has been it's progressing quite well some of my faculty members our own incubator people have been involved in uh, in helping that and uh, that is something that they should push hard uh, it is a hard, it is a long journey and also there is also there is a belief that today that incubation startup means only IT and some mobile phone and app. I mean, there are many, many ideas out there, especially the rural uh, people. I mean, they do their own innovation. They, they don't get any support and there are technology support will definitely help. But it is not about technology only. And uh, this this T hub is about Telangana hub and, and they do have focus on other agriculture, other technologies. 
yes today it or computing is a will be a major part in a partner in in making things efficient and fast but let us think beyond that also and i think that that thinking is there in telangana government and we would like to uh, to foster that and and coming to edinburgh i think triple it hyderabad has had strong research relationship but this happens in the in the group to group or individual to individual basis because edinburgh is has probably the strongest uh, groups in ai and especially the natural language processing and triple it hyderabad is been the pioneering group and largest group in natural language processing in the country and we have had you know dozens of our students go and get phd there and some of them have come back and help and our adjunct faculty are helping us and so on so i'm glad to see these connections thank you thank you i think that was uh, extremely extremely valuable I've, i've written down two recommendations from your end one is a startup in every uh, college and university of the state i think that's a great one typically when we think about incubators we limit ourselves to the premier institutions and i think if you can have them up to the colleges that's really where the uh, the trickle will start hitting the the common man uh, the second of course you spoke about infra support to new universities that's something that i think you started off giving the example of isb and triple it hyderabad so great two recommendations uh, mr ramanathan from your end uh, do you do you see uh, uh, incubation innovation new startups actually becoming a big funding source for universities going forward uh, yeah in fact um, one of the things that we have actually encourage every one of our incubators to do uh, we give them a grant for 5 years uh, one of the conditions associated with that is that you have to become self sustainable within that next 5 year within those 5 years which means you have to be able to tap into the venture capital market you have to tap into the private industry you have to be able to stand on your own legs uh, your startups uh, you know uh, we we gave them a simple formula saying if we are investing x in you uh, how can you convert that to 5x in terms of external investments that can come in and i think incubators can become a great source of potential funding for applied research innovation uh, to a university because uh, one of the things we also said uh, when we con- when we set up these incubators where mostly we set it up in universities 70% are in universities the others are in private institutions and ngos and so on and so forth because we want to encourage um, innovation in the private sector uh, but we put a condition that this incubator has to be separately run even if it is within the university campus it has to have a dedicated ceo the ceo should not be a professor from the university who is having also alternate uh, responsibilities of conducting classes and so on and so forth uh he could be a professor who wants to become the ceo of the incubator we don't have a problem but this needs a dedicated focus because you need to do outreach events you need to find out great uh, startups from within and outside the community uh, that you are in uh, you need to encourage the students to uh, create startups and you need to bring the private sector very strongly here to become self sustainable so i think they will become a great source of funding for the university because uh, and the university should give access to its technology lab research labs they should when they are conducting research they should also have an eye that what how much of this research you know the lab to the field that uh, honorable prime minister talks about that should be a focus how much of your research that you are doing finally finds itself into the market and there is basic research which is non compromisable but then there is a whole lot of applied research which we never see uh, finds fruition in the marketplace and that is where the university and the incubator can work together very well and be able to build on the relationship and and you know uh, be of benefit to both both uh, each other where i come from so definitely going to pass some of these recommendations to them uh, your last thoughts amrita uh i'd love to hear more of course we've spoken a lot about innovation we've spoken about a lot about innovation but let's think about you know creating a university of edinburgh scale university in india do you think that's doable a university that's a top 20 university we are still like in the 300s 400s as far as rankings are concerned do you think in the next 10 years 15 years india will see the emergence of a university of the scale of university of edinburgh and if yes what can the state of telangana do to attract a university like that or build a university like that um 
Thank you. That's a very nicely controversial question. <laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, debate on, you know, rankings and their value, uh, Professor Kosla. And um, I also, you know, question that though we enjoy our status as a top 20 global institution, and by most rankings are quite, you know, in the top 50. Um, you know, does India need to achieve that? I mean, it is a matter of prestige, and it would be nice to see India in that. Yes. Um, but I think what's really important is, you know, for universities based here, whether they're, you know, coming from elsewhere or the ones here, and, and I would lean to the, the, you know, the excellent institutions that we already have here, is can we achieve, you know, that sense of, like you talked about, Kanpur, a true strong civic university? Can we achieve that industry engagement and innovation? These are the important questions to focus on. Uh, and I think the ranking will come. You know, whether it's from in, in look at it from a global perspective or anything, that is a truly successful university. We know that we're already excellent and world class and churning out, you know, some of the best uh, talent, some of the best uh, entrepreneurs. There is no doubt about that. Can we loop them in better? You know, can we create that alumni dialogue and therefore bring, uh, you know, those connections and that support, that donor support that all institutions need to create or develop that ecosystem very quickly? to welcome and use those alumni funds or even you know funds from industry in a way that you know universal industry wants to come and work with us work with the institutions and you know uh, support its development because the more real world interaction we have you know the more we we as institutions in india are going to become sort of uh, you know successful and right up there i mean one of the things i mentioned right in one of the things about the university that the special staff what is professional staff? Does that align with the kind of stuff? No, we are losing you. I think there's some uh, challenge with your with your sound. You want to try again? I think there's an echo which is coming. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. So I was saying that we have uh, you know six thousand professional staff at the university. Professional staff in UK universities are valued as much as academic staff. And we have great responsibility and we have deliverables. Um, and what do this uh, professional staff do? For example, the CEO of an innovation center, they may be an academic or not, but they are fully focused on that professional role of creating a strong innovation incubation ecosystem. Um, and, you know, we have so many, uh, this allows our academics to really focus on what they need to do best to research, to teach, uh, to mentor. Uh, and and to innovate. So, um, you know, I think these are some of the things that Indian institutions need to think about. And also, I think the Indian ecosystem needs to be very open to innovative models of engagement uh, with overseas organizations, whether it's higher education companies. And I think we have the potential to get there. Can we be clear of mind and really focused and get there? I certainly hope so. And I think um, I, I would, I would, yeah, hope for that. Yeah, just to add to that, if I may, uh, Amrita brought a very important point of collaboration between universities in India and abroad. And uh, But I also think uh, there is a tremendous amount of collaboration that is needed within you know, between universities in a particular state. Uh, that is also missing. Uh, what I would like to suggest, I mean, if you look at Manufacturing USA, which is an organization of 17 different uh, uh, universities, focusing on different areas, you know, some, some focusing on robotics, some focusing on artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, can we create within every state a cluster of universities focusing on one particular area or two particular areas so that they're able to share? If, for example, uh, ISB is focusing on, let us say, management or marketing and finance, and they are talking to five other institutions there who are also focusing on that, that cluster of universities will bring tremendous multiplication power uh, to what is happening in the ecosystem. And similarly on AI or similarly on robotics or similarly on IR 4.0 or whatever, right? Uh, I think this sort of collaboration is, many universities are all trying to do the same thing. Uh, it is good, not that you should not, but how can you also collaborate and bring the benefits of what is happening across? And I think there the Telangana state can play a leadership role in trying to enable maybe eight or nine cluster of universities working together on specific problems, uh, which can put India in a leadership position.
I think uh, I have to unmute myself. I'm going to close with a small anecdote. Uh, I was with the provost of Oxford asking him, what makes Oxford? What makes a great university? And he looked at me and said very proudly, 900 years. I looked at him and said, uh, 900 years, oh God, but I've only got 10. And he said, you must be smoking, son. Uh, I said, no, I'm not. If Google and IBM, if Google and Facebook can beat the heck out of IBM in five to seven years or 10 years, there's no reason why institutions, which are the new age institutions, cannot go out and disrupt the whole ecosystem of education. The message I'm giving is, yes, we have to learn from the biggies of the world, but sitting in India, we have to look at disruption in a very different way. I love the whole thought of collaboration you spoke about over here, uh, Mr. Ramanan. We, for example, are doing very, very high-end research right now, not because we have the money, but because we're sending all the, uh, the, the materials over to the Stanfords of the world where the, the research is actually happening, the experiments are happening, and we're doing the analysis. So you're breaking the value chain, and that's what Indian institutions have to do. They have to collaborate. They have to align with great institutions like the University of Edinburgh. But more importantly, I think within ourselves, we need to also collaborate. So I'm personally going to reach out to each one of you. Uh, hopefully, we can collaborate. Hopefully, we can make the state of Telangana a great hub of education. And hopefully, Hyderabad can actually become uh, and compete with the Silicon Valley of the world. Thank you once again very, very much. You know, I'm just recovering from COVID. I was very nervous because this is my first interaction after 15 days of hell. And I thought I will not get energy. But I got so much energy from this discussion. It is so amazing. Thank you very, very much for once again, a wonderful discussion. And hopefully we can take these recommendations to the state of Telangana. Have a great day, viewers. And have a great day, panelists. Bye-bye. Thank you, Atul. Stay safe, stay strong. Thank you. Thank you. All, all the herbal medicines worked. Thank you, Professor. <laughs>